Hi everyone, I'm Heaven, and I'm also Heaven. What? Who is the second Heaven in this dude? Oh, it's just one Heaven? Like uh, the parent trap where they lied to you and they said there were two twins, but it was one Lindsay Lohan? How did they even do that scene with the handshake thing? What? Anyways, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Clearly, I've been thinking about a lot of things. One, the election. Two, the parent trap. So what do we have on the show today, Heaven? I'm glad you asked, Heaven. <laughs> Yo, I miss you all so much. I'm so glad I get to be in the studio talking to you all. Uh, we have a great show for you today. Maybe in solidarity, you checked into Cannonball, North Dakota on Facebook. Or maybe you've already booked your flight to join the movement. Or maybe not. It's barely on TV news, and what's happening at the Dakota Access Pipeline is a huge conversation that's not really being talked about enough. Authorities have been using fire hoses on demonstrators in 26 degree weather over the weekend, and 16 people have been arrested just yesterday. So Tracy and I thought it was important to help keep that conversation going and keep Standing Rock in people's minds. And if you're like us, maybe you know a little bit about what's going down in Standing Rock, but we all collectively, I think, need to know more. I include myself in that collective. So that's why we've invited Dr. Adrian Keene back on the show. Dr. Keene is a Cherokee scholar, an activist, and creator of the blog Native Appropriations, which if you have not checked out yet, uh, what are you doing? What's going on in your life? I understand. We're busy, but get it together. Get it together. Uh, just also a little heads up for y'all. We taped this conversation with Dr. Keene last week before the violence of the past weekend. So bear that in mind. Welcome back to another round, girl. Thank you. I'm so honored to be back. I appreciate it. So where are you calling us from? <laughs> I am currently in Denver. Um, I just got back from Standing Rock. I was there for about five days. And now I'm here for the American Studies Association Conference in Denver. Wait, the American Studies? Yes. <laughs> Since the last time that we talked, I got a job as a professor. Oh, hey. <laughs> That's Professor Dr. Adrian yeah. King to you. So I'm now in the Department oh of American Studies and Ethnic Studies at Brown. Oh, my goodness. Dope. Round of applause, everyone. Clap, Thank clap, you. clap. Golf claps, yeah. golf claps. <laughs> <laughs> Ethnic Studies claps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so for people who might not have been following this story, maybe even from the beginning, but definitely since uh, all the election madness has happened, mm -hmm. what is going on with the Dakota Access Pipeline and why, why are people having a sense of urgency about it right now? Yeah, so for folks who haven't been following it all, the Dakota Access Pipeline is a over 1,000-mile oil pipeline that is scheduled to carry sweet crude oil, which is the actual name of the stuff, um, from <laughs> the back in oil fields in North Dakota all the way to refineries in Illinois. And the pipeline is scheduled to cross underneath the Missouri River and Lake Oahe, which are the primary source of drinking water for the community of Standing Rock Sioux, which is just about a mile, half mile south of that river crossing. So this has become a really major issue on kind of an international stage, both because it is a environmental catastrophe waiting to happen because we know that oil pipelines leak. It's not a if, it's a when, but also because this is a huge infringement on the autonomy and sovereignty of the Standing Rock Nation. They really weren't properly consulted in this process and haven't really been um, treated in the way that they should be as a sovereign nation. But the urgency that is coming up recently is that the pipeline is largely completed except for the river crossing, and the company mm. stands to lose about $3 billion if this pipeline doesn't go through. And so while I was there, they brought in all of the equipment in the cover of night at like 3 in the morning um, and set everything up on the drill pad. So they are pretty much ready to disregard the Army Corps of Engineers, who has repeatedly asked them to pause construction and just face the fine, because the fine isn't going to be $3 billion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So for the people who are for the Dakota Access Pipeline, what are they arguing? Um, what in their mind is the usefulness of this thing? They're arguing that it creates jobs in construction, that it will um, keep oil prices 
low for consumers, um, but both of those things are kind of patently untrue. It created a bunch of construction jobs that are going to dissolve as soon as the pipeline is created. And the back in oil fields where this oil is coming from, um, two years ago when Energy Transfer Partners signed all of the contracts for this oil pipeline, the oil fields were really producing and the cost of oil was was good and now it's the opposite where the the back end is really drying up and the price of oil is is plummeting so there's not really a good reason for this pipeline even though there are plenty of supporters and i saw plenty of them in um, north dakota who are behind the pipeline but really i think it comes down to a lot of racism against the native people there that it's not really about this pipeline it's about them wanting to shut down these native folks who are protecting their land and their sovereignty. What does native sovereignty or sacred land mean to you? I mean, it's it's been very interesting because it has converged with these international environmental movements. And that is why there is so much outside support around this tiny little community in North Dakota. But Mm. to me, this is really about the fundamental connection between us as Native peoples and our homelands. So for the community of Standing Rock and also for all of the other Lakota um, Sioux communities, the Ocheti Shikoan um, is what they call themselves, the Council of the Seven Fires, I think it is. These lands that the pipeline is cutting through right now are their homelands from time immemorial. Um, They are the sites of innumerable uh, burials. The land right now that the pipeline is... um, building through on the the river crossing has documented burial sites, has documented sacred sites. And so it's just a blatant disregard of that connection to the land and that connection to place and space. And then also on the sovereignty side of things, I keep thinking about that if Dakota Access wanted to build a pipeline that was going to threaten the drinking water for 18 million people in Canada or in Mexico, what the Mm. consultation process would have to look like for that to happen. And that's what's happening here. Standing Rock Sioux is a a sovereign nation. They have the right to be consulted at the same level that you would with any other sovereign nation. And that did not happen in this process. So to me, that's what is at the heart of all of this. The environmental piece is huge as well, but it really is fundamentally about the continuation of settler colonialism. Mm. So you mentioned the land at Ochetisha Cohen, which is the main hub for all the organizing. It's near Standing Rock, but not on the reservation. Uh, And we're going to be hearing from some folks at the camp there later in this episode. But first, you just brought up settler colonialism. I think that's an important phrase. How would you like to define that? Um, (laughs) I know that's a big topic. No, I mean, uh, there's a scholar named Patrick Wolf who describes settler colonialism as a structure, not an event. So it's an outside colonizing force that instead of coming in to extract resources and send them back to a home country or another homeland, Mm -hmm. their entire goal is to come in and create a new nation state. And that's what has happened here in the U.S. and then also in places like Australia and New Zealand and a lot of other places where you have this new settler society being built upon indigenous society. Word. (laughs) Yo, okay. So I understand that I'm in some capacity asking you to speak for all Native people, which obviously no one human can do. (laughs) Do Do you find that there are a lot of differing opinions in the Native community about how to handle this, if there are benefits to this for some people and not for others. Yeah, I mean, it's super complicated. The one piece is that there are large oil industry things going on on native lands in North Dakota. So there are tribes that have been working with oil companies that are getting money from um, the oil drilling that is happening on their lands. Mm. What kind of money? Like good money. (laughs) Um, Like oil money? (laughs) Yeah. uh, But then there are other communities that are split where 
depending on if your land parcel has oil on it, like you could be making a lot of money where your neighbors could not be making any. But I mean, we've seen tribes coming out to support Standing Rock that have their own problematic relationships with extractive industries. Like Navajo Nation came out to support, yet they have big coal mining uh, going on in their community and things like that. Mm. But um, when you drive into Ocheti Shikoan, which is the main kind of camp where everyone is, there are tribal flags that line both sides of the the road into the camp. Mm. And it's this incredibly powerful moment to see all of that and realize that each of those tribes, each of those nations has lent their support to this cause, to this community. Word. Let's hear from some folks on the ground in Ochetisha Cohen talking about how they're lending support. So what we're building is a longhouse. Um, we call it a Nishquito. So essentially in the middle um, there are three smoke holes at the top and there's uh, three uh, fires in the middle and um, it's for the school the Meniwikoni uh, Sacred Water School here. Uh, For the school what they want to use it for is uh, classroom uh, slash library they want to put books in there and let kids read and also teach. Uh, I'm not making the longhouse as tall as uh, they usually make them just to keep the heat kind of close to where the kids are Um, For me, uh, it was definitely an investment in our uh, indigenous children, um, and they're the ones who are going to carry on our values and our traditional ways. At first I was worried about like snow crushing the tents, but the snow doesn't really build up that much because it's the winds, the winds that really get you. And so if I build a really nice windbreak, you know, right when people can get out of the wind, that's, that's what really warms people up. And also, you know, we're here, like, came back and forth from Washington twice. So we're supposed to leave this place as we found it, and, like, I'm trying to be minimalist. I don't want to dig up the ground too much. And on top of it, they're sending, like, tons of money and resources to uh, support the camps. I know my tribe, which is out in Oklahoma, sent like six semi-trucks full of firewood. Word. And they're still out there supporting this because our land, our water, our natural resources are under attack from companies and non-natives and the U.S. government. Like these are themes that occur over and over and over again throughout Native communities in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and will continue to deal with, especially under the next administration. You know what? Let's get into that. (laughs) Do we have to? (laughs) Do we have to is a question I ask every day uh, (laughs) since the Trump administration. No, I know Obama made a statement on uh, November 1st suggesting a possible rerouting of the pipeline. We're monitoring this closely. And, um, you know, I think as a general rule, uh, my view is that there is a way for us to accommodate sacred lands of Native Americans. Uh, and you know, I think that right now the Army Corps is examining whether there are ways to reroute uh, uh, this pipeline. Which to me is particularly interesting because the pipeline was originally going to run north of Bismarck, which is about 90% white. But then a bunch of white folks rejected the pipeline because it could contaminate their water. And now the same pipeline is slated to run through native lands. What the fuck? For real, though, what do people think about the Obama administration's role in this? And are those feelings changing because of the Trump administration? Is it any different? How are people feeling on the ground? Yeah, I mean, I think on the Obama side of things, people are extremely disappointed in him right Mm. now because um, Obama was the first president to visit native communities like visit actual reservations while he was a sitting president and he uh only visited a couple and one of them was standing rock Mm. so the the irony of that is i mean he sat at the powwow he took pictures with babies he met the elders he got to know people in the community and now as those same people are being maced and being pepper sprayed and being shot with rubber bullets and uh, their graves are being dug up, he has been largely silent. So it definitely was disheartening to see that while all of this violence, this 
extreme, extreme violence against the protectors who are completely unarmed, who um, are really there in prayer. Um, Obama was was completely silent on it. Mm. And then uh, I I have a hard time even wrapping my head around the Trump thing still. Like, it still seems very surreal. But he has money invested in this pipeline. Um, In the companies that are supporting the pipeline, he has money um, tied up in it. So he definitely is going to be in support of this. Um, He's also said that the Keystone XL pipeline is going to be one of the first actions that he'll um, put through in his first 100 days. So I think with the election... Surprisingly, I think there were I had friends who were out there who were trying to film reactions to the election when they were um, at Standing Rock. And a lot of the native folks were kind of like, yeah, this is awful and it sucks. But honestly, there isn't that much of a difference between administrations for us. And it's kind of true in some ways, like some of the best presidents in U.S. history for natives have been awful presidents all around. Like Nixon did some really great stuff for Indian country. So Mm. it's always weird to see like what's going to happen. I think Trump is going to be awful for all marginalized communities for all people of color. I mean, he sued the casino in Connecticut because um, there was a concern over competition with um, his potential businesses out there. And in his court testimony talked about how the natives who were running and owned um, those casinos weren't real Indians because of the way that they looked, um, because of the way they behaved. I will tell you right now, uh, they don't look like Indians to me. And they don't look like the Indians. Now, maybe we say politically correct or not politically correct. They don't look like Indians to me. And they don't look like Indians to Indians. And a lot of people are laughing at it. And you're telling how tough it is, how rough it is to get approved. They don't look like Indians to me, sir. So that's Donald Trump, casino owner and future president, at a congressional hearing in 1993. Huh. And that's like his sworn testimony. Um, He talked about how they weren't real Indians. So Jesus Christ. There's going to be a lot going on there. But I think it is scary to think about how... This will not be the last pipeline that we're going to have to fight in the next four years. Wow. Okay. I think the mentality of folks oscillates between, I think, resignation, like sadness, like um, hopelessness, and digging in and realizing that now is the time to fight um, and that we've built up this community of resistance. We've built up this spirit, this really beautiful, prayerful place, and that a lot of amazing work can come out of that community that's been created at Standing Rock. Mm. And that's kind of how I feel right now is that I've been politicized in a way that I haven't been before around these issues, I think being out there really does something to you, like seeing the police in their full riot gear. I I got followed. What do you mean? Can you describe that for us, for people who are probably never going to be able to see this? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I've been, my experience is so limited compared to the folks who have been out there for months. I mean, there are people who have been living there since April. So I can't imagine what kind of mental stress and physical stress they're under after being out there for so long if I feel the way I do after my two trips equal like eight days collectively, which isn't even that much. But Mm. um, the two trips were very different. The first trip was at the end of September where there was still um, a lot of I think there was still a lot of excitement, a lot of hope. Um, Being at camp was like this big kind of community gathering. There was a lot of singing and laughing and dancing, and it was a largely very Native space, too. Um, There weren't very many white folks there. And in the subsequent months, a lot has happened. We've seen huge mass arrests. We've seen major, major police brutality from Morton County and then the pipeline is getting closer and closer to the river. So I've been seeing the movement in the news a lot more in the last few months. And the policing you mentioned isn't an isolated experience. It's not like the first time this has happened. Here's a member of the Punka tribe from Oklahoma talking about this experience of violence and policing in North Dakota. About a month ago, we had a camp up there past Turtle Island where we built the bridge to maybe three quarters of a mile down right in front of where they were trying to build the pipeline. We set up a few hundred of us 
and they came with six armored vehicles, automatic weapons, snipers, riot gear, over 200 police, ATVs, helicopters, planes. They broke my tent and when I got it back there was paint that was still wet, thick globs of it. They snapped the poles. I never got my sleeping bag back. They took a ton of wood stoves that Mikasi bought for the community. They hit him with a bunch of felonies because they knew he was our leader and they beat the shit out of him in jail. They arrested over a hundred people and they took the land. But the beautiful thing was is that people here have so much spirit that we're still here. And on that day, there was a herd of buffalo that came and an eagle that flew over it. So when I went back this time, the spirit of camp feels definitely very different. Um, it's more entrenched, it's a little bit quieter. Um, part of that is due to the weather. People can't really be outside as much anymore because it's cold. Yeah, it's winter now. <laughs> yes, it's That was a freezing. genuine thought I had. It was like, how do these actions go forth in this environment? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, the amazing thing is um, the native folks who live on the plains have lived on the plains forever so they know how to live sure, in sure. through Maybe the winter no uh, <laughs> so that's been that is actually very cool to watch too is seeing all the traditional mm. structures go up so there's a ton of teepees now because teepees are really um can survive that kind of weather um there mm. are a bunch of yurts which are not indigenous to our communities but are definitely oh God, indigenous I just learned about yurts yeah. on HGTV <laughs> so there's now a I'm bunch of yurts but it's true. Um, and it was actually very cool they said sent someone out to teach um, folks the proper protocols, like indigenous protocols around the yurts, like how you're supposed to step into them, the ways that you um, treat the front door and stuff. So there's been kind of indigenous knowledge exchange around how to mm -hmm. live in these environments. So being back at camp this time is when I participated more in the direct actions. The first time was kind of largely social. Let me help sort of sort donations. Let me walk around and talk to people. Let me like help out in ways that I can um, pick up trash. Um, but in the second visit, I was um, connected up with some of the independent journalists who have been there for months. Um, and we were driving around, we were taking photos of the Dakota Access um, hired mercenaries. We were getting drone footage of the drill pad at 3.30 in the morning, uh, bouncing wow. over dirt roads. And to feel the intensity of that was really hard um, to know that the next corner we came around, we could be stopped by police, we could be arrested. Um, they have shown no sort of mercy at all when they encounter the protectors out there doing this kind of work and action. So it was definitely, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Ivy League professor who sits in an office in Rhode Island and <laughs> I was um, being like pursued by by dabble mercenaries uh this trip so to see the spirit and the um the heart of the people who are out there that they're doing this day in and day out to protect the water for everybody to protect the land mm -hmm. to protect the sovereignty it's just an incredibly powerful experience and i'm so grateful to the people who've been out there for all these months and that can keep up that intensity. I don't think I could have stayed three more days. Like it was, it was a little mm. too much for my cortisol levels. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> and to see the, the violence that they're met with, um, all of the time and to mm. see the, the real PTSD that a lot of the protectors are dealing with. Um, one of the girls we were driving around with, um, we got stopped by the police at the roadblock on Highway 1806, and she started having a panic attack in the back seat because she had been arrested on October 27th when they uh, tore down the, the North Camp, the treaty camp, and she was kicked by a police officer and still has um, nerve damage in her shoulder and was thrown in a dog kennel at the jail, had a number Jesus. written on her arm. So she um, just like the, the police weren't doing anything to us. They were just checking in to see why we were at the roadblock. Um, but just seeing the flashing lights and hearing the, the siren really sent her into a state of panic. So 
it's not it's not a game to people out there. And I think mm. that's hard to see too, is there's a lot of white folks who have come in that want to like be a part of the movement and they're not out there getting chased by the cops. They're not out there putting their bodies on the line. They're really there to just sort of live out their weird mystical Indian fantasies. Oh. <laughs> Um, I kind of want to talk about that a little because you're talking about like the sort of native response and then the environmentalist or the larger sort of hippie community. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there are tensions there? There are definitely tensions. And I think in any social movement, there are tensions. So this definitely is not unique to Standing Rock and unique to the Dakota Access fight. Mm. But this trip, I got extremely uncomfortable with the presence of a large number of these sort of hippie Burning Man white folks, like not to mince words. And mm. it was it was weird because a lot of folks are coming in. And again, there have been people who've been there since April. And so the random idea that you have most likely has been thought of and has been discussed and has been put <laughs> through the cultural protocols. And um, I don't know, it's just... It's a very, like, white, uh, I hate to say it, it's just a very white person thing to do, to come into a space <laughs> and, like, think that you know what's going on and not listen to the people who are there and think you have the answers and kind of take over. So um, it's definitely, there's a need for allies. There's a need for true accomplices who are going to be out there getting arrested, who are going to be out there listening to the community, listening to the elders, following the cultural protocols. Because in indigenous communities, the way that you enter spaces is automatically by deferring to the folks whose land you're on, um, by mm. deferring to the voices of elders, of um, people from the community, uh, listening really hard, <laughs> listening for a long time. Um, in our communities, knowledge comes to you when it's supposed to. So you're taught to kind of wait and that when you're supposed to know something, you will know it. Um, and that is not really the way that things happen in non-native spaces. So I think that's mm. hard for people who want to come in and are like, I'm here, like, I'm ready, like, let's do this. And it's like, no, like, you need to listen to how we do things here. You need to become a part of the community before will trust you kind of to be a part of this mm. and that's not to say that there aren't amazing um non-native folks there there have been people like running the kitchen since the beginning like largely non-native people that are up to their elbows in canned corn every night and are <laughs> peeling hundreds and hundreds of potatoes and chopping up um yes, donated allies <laughs> yeah <Peel those> potatoes <laughs> so i think I still want people to go out there. I still want people to see it. I want them to support, but I want them to do it in the right way. I want them to not ever be sitting idle. I want them to be chopping wood and sorting donations and picking up trash. And if they're not going to the direct actions, that they are engaged in some sort of um piece of the movement that's happening at camp. I'm not going to lie. When Shailene Woodley was arrested, Shailene Woodley, the star of the Fault in Our Stars, which is a movie mm -hmm. that I did enjoy. <laughs> and also the young adult series, the Divergent series. Uh, she's out here. She's doing stuff. Mm -hmm. But she was arrested and she made a point to say I was arrested for standing up a standing rock. Um, and that is how this story did kind of resurface back into my social feeds, back right. into like my news cycle. Do you find people spokespeople like her useful? Is she even a spokesperson? Is <laughs> I that think... a fair way to describe her? <laughs> so with Shailene, there is the public narrative and then there is the stuff that she's doing behind the scenes. And I actually- Okay, um, all right, give us a tea, girl. Yeah, so no, I mean, I, shout out to the native auntie who came up to me after my talk at Colorado State and gave it to me for being mean to Shailene um, in my talk. Oh, shout out to all so, the <laughs> um, She uh, was totally right. Um, she said that what we see in the media is only a small part of it. Shailene has been um, really working with the International Indigenous Youth Council who, 
are largely the reason why this got started. They're the youth that um, they did a spirit run um, where they started um, in the community and they ran all the way to Washington, D.C. to the Army Corps of Engineers. And Shailene was really supportive of that, um, met with the runners, I think even ran with them for a part of that, and that wasn't um, in the news. Um, but I also get frustrated when I see that things like her arrests get so much attention mm. when there have been hundreds of Native people who were arrested before and after that, and they didn't get hashtags that said free whoever, mm. but it did draw attention to it. And I think the danger comes, though, when you have a non-Native person who um, is still learning about Indigenous communities given this huge platform um, to speak on the issue. And so sometimes some of her um, quotations that get pulled out are things that make me cringe a little bit. Like she had a mm. quote about how we're all indigenous to this earth. And um, I, I did see that. She'd be doing that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and so things like that narrative is not the narrative that I think needs to be pushed out. But she's definitely trying. Is that what you were saying in your speech that the auntie was like, girl, <laughs> give her a break? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I didn't know that much about the um, the youth council stuff. And to her credit, like she posted this really problematic thing about um, somebody was encouraging people to get this tattoo in support of the movement. And it was a Thunderbird and it was designed by a native um, tattoo artist. But I still felt really uncomfortable with the idea of like, that being it's kind of like the safety pin like if that's like your mm. only um engagement with this are you really an ally um and so i tweeted to her about it i called it out and she immediately responded and said if you're uncomfortable with it i'll take it down and she did so um she is being held accountable by native folks and is listening which i think is important and not a lot of uh celebrities who engage in native issues do that um, but there's been support from people like Mark Ruffalo was out there. He um, <laughs> All right, Mark. <laughs> I know. Um, he says Leonardo DiCaprio is going to come out at some point. We'll see. Okay, um, <laughs> Leo. <laughs> but Look at y'all doing stuff. Um, that lady who is in Titanic who plays like old Rose or no, Rose's mom. I don't know. There was some lady from Titanic who was there <laughs> this time. Um, all these people were talking to her and I didn't know who she was, but some lady from Titanic was there this week. Um, it bees like that sometimes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a double-edged sword. You want the attention, but I feel like sometimes the the attention goes to the wrong, the wrong people and doesn't get the right message out when you're just talking to celebrities and not talking to folks who are on the ground actually doing the work and in the space day in and day out. Here's Dave Guthrie of the Klinka tribe in Alaska talking about some of the day-to-day -day work that they're doing on the ground. Um, I've been here since the end of September and God brought me down here and he'll tell me when it's time to go home. This is my car and I'm working on this truck. I'm changing the bearings out and uh, I get cold. It's cold, very cold here so I'm cutting off the wind. I got a little base heater inside that I'm going to turn on as soon as I start working on it mm -hmm. and uh, any problem that you can think of with the car I'm running into right here is wheel bearings after this is a fuel pump inside a guy's fuel tank and they just had a call out up there at the mic that someone needs their, their heater fix in their car and that's just today direct actions are first if there's a direct action right now I wouldn't be working on this car, I'd be out there because I carry all my tools in my van and if someone breaks down on an action, I can be there to help get them back to camp. I want to go back to a point, maybe this wasn't even a point you're trying to make, but I've noticed you use the phrase protectors a lot instead of maybe even uh, protesters. Yeah. Is that specific and for a reason? Yeah. So that's the terminology, the language that the folks at the camps have been using since the beginning. Um, because I think that really is what's going on here, is that this is a fight to protect um, the land, to protect the water, to protect sovereignty. It's not necessarily a protest against a pipeline. Mm. Also, because so much of the media narrative has been this like wild Indians on the plains kind of things, like talking about mm. 
painted up warriors on horseback and shooting arrows at helicopters and just which is untrue um and <laughs> like all sorts of stuff that i think thinking about the folks out there as protectors um automatically puts a different image in people's minds so i, I i'm curious how y'all are like taking care of yourselves out there the, the fact that this has been going on for months the fact that it's about to be winter yeah i, I just feel like this is also just a centuries long overwhelming fight <laughs> how how do you keep doing it how do you take care of yourselves yeah so um sh- so first of all shout out to my really good friend jen weston who is from standing rock and she has been my um source on everything that's been going on um she is the one who took me out there the first time she introduced me to people she had a beautiful ribbon skirt made for me so i could have a, a ceremonial skirt when i was there um wow. she has just been incredible and she and i were actually texting as i was on the plane on my way over here and talking about how it's hard for us because we haven't been on the ground she lives out in um in Rhode Island with me and she goes back mm. every month um for a couple of days at to a Stanley time Rock? yeah um wow. but it's been really hard because we're out watching the live feeds so we're not like sitting there but we're still experiencing that trauma of mm. seeing our friends getting maced and her like seeing her brother who's a frontline medic who's been there since the beginning um getting maced on a live stream while she's sitting in her office and um getting and our friends getting arrested and beat with clubs and things like that and we are safe like physically but um i've been having nightmares about it still like i watched six hours of feeds on october 27th of people on the front lines and all the arrests happening and it has weighed really heavily on me so Mm. so she and i were talking about how it's hard to say like we've been so affected when we haven't been there but that's how a lot of native folks are feeling even when they're not on the ground and so i can only imagine how people are feeling who are there so i've been i've been really trying to uh take care of myself um i've been talking to my therapist about it i have been um yeah shout out to therapy. <laughs> yes. um i have been writing i mean i think writing is the the big outlet for me um being able to share on twitter on my blog with folks what's going on i've been really um using this entire fight in my teaching so um in my classroom this semester we've been really talking about it from a Native Studies perspective, like thinking about what this means, and that has been helpful to me. And I definitely have been praying a lot, and that like has not been something that I've really done in the past, but being in that space and seeing how powerful prayer and ceremony is for everyone who's there, it really has translated to the way that I'm practicing self-care outside of that. Mm. And there is a wellness teepee now, um, which sounds funny to say, but it is um, <laughs> it is there. They have um, mental health professionals there. Um, there is an amazing sort of um, acupuncturist collective that is there and i am a huge fan of acupuncture now so um that's cool to see every community needs a space for healing right you know we need somewhere that we can go to heal the physical body we need somewhere to go to heal the emotional body my english name is samantha my ojibwe name is uh, wasno day i'm from chippewas of the thames first nation in southwestern ontario i arrived about three days ago to Oshati Shakoi camp um, and I'm a family doctor uh, but I also practice in traditional indigenous uh, healing practices. This is the medic slash wellness area and uh, we have primary care physicians so doing you know actual western allopathic medicine in one tent. Uh, we have midwives uh, and women's health in one tent. We have um, herbal herbalists uh, and energy workers such as Reiki um, and that sort of thing in one tent we have chiropractics um, and then we have an emotional wellness tent and so I was called more to sit in this space and be available and we really just let the people coming identify what modality or what it is that they need um, just give them the information and they choose for themselves. They have um, a lot of ceremonial spaces, a lot of um, sweat lodges and things like that um, to try Mm. and heal the protectors while they're there. 
but I do know that people are going to be dealing with the effects of this for years and years to come. Word. I hope this is not too personal of a question, but what do you get out of prayer? What do you pray for? I've just been, I've been really praying for safety for everyone, um, for the water, praying for the land. I think a lot of indigenous ways of spirituality are about being grateful and then also just being hopeful for protection into the future and for safety for everyone who's there. Could you let us know where to follow you and more of your work and maybe some other people you want to give a shout out to? Sure. So I am on Twitter at Native Approps, and my blog is nativeappropriations.com. And I have a huge um, No Dapple update post on my blog right now that has a million links that you can follow to find out more information about where to donate. Some of the cool people that I think are really great resources are um, there's this independent journalist um, group called Unicorn Riot. And you can Mm -hmm. follow them for great coverage there on the front lines. Um, Myron Dewey and Digital Smoke Signals also live stream from a lot of the actions. And then there's some really great um, protectors on Facebook that I link to on that site. Folks like uh, Wash J. Wynn Young, Faith Spotted Eagle, Tara Huska with um, Honor the Earth, uh, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, who is the founder of Sacred Stone Camp, um, Greg Greycloud, Uh, There's just a lot of amazing people. So I link to them on my blog and I try to um, boost them on my Twitter as well. So lots of ways to support, lots of people to follow um, in this fight. Word. And we're going to keep all those links on our newsletter and on our BuzzFeed page, buzzfeed.com. So Dr. Professor Adrian Keene is going to join us for a little little game and stuff. Some fun. But first, we got to, you know, pay the bills and stuff. Games ahead. Ahoy! So, we're back. (laughs) Um, So, we want to play a game with you about pilgrim names. Uh, (laughs) You know I love me some white people names. I'm going to list a bunch of names, and you have to pick which is the real human pilgrim name. Oh my god, I'm so excited. So which one of these is a person who was actually on the Mayflower in 1651? Wow, okay. <laughs> Let's get started. All right, you ready? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. This is supposed to be fun, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> pick the colonizer. I got it. Pick the colonizer. <laughs> we have... True Love Brewster, Lesson Laden, Peter Cushion, and Moses Crackstone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of these could be real. Um, I really want it to be Moses Crackstone, so I'm going to go with <laughs> Moses Crackstone. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you appreciating this name. <laughs> <laughs> but you are incorrect. It is True Love Brewster. True Love Brewster. Wow. I mean, I thought my parents were optimistic when naming me heaven. Yeah. True, true Love. love. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What a setup. <laughs> All right. We're going to go to the next one. Peregrine Green. Sorry. I'm pronouncing that wrong. Peregrine <laughs> Green. Okay. Excuse me. Producers gave me a wonderful note. Peregrine Green. Diggory Chilton. <laughs> Fear Allerton and Priscilla Hubbard. Again, that's <laughs> Perjurin Green. No, I producers still laughing. They're like having <laughs> together. Peregrine? Peregrine? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Peregrine Green. Diggory Chilton. Fear Allerton and Priscilla Hubbard. <laughs> I mean, this is a setup. These are all absurd. Priscilla Hubbard sounds like the most like normal one, so I'm gonna say it's not that one. Okay, um, process of elimination. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other one's name was Fear. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say it's the one you can't pronounce. Peregrine Green. Oh, you are so close. It is Fear oh, Allerton. Oh, see, I thought you guys wouldn't do that to me to put True Love next to Fear. That makes sense. That's an absurd <laughs> name. So. In the same vein that my parents were optimistic, <laughs> these parents were like, sad. I don't know about this baby. <laughs> I'm going to just call it fear. <laughs> and we 
think white people have crazy names now. <laughs> it is no Ryan's previous, but <laughs> still. All right, next one. Remember Britteridge, resolved white, desire tinker, and wrestling Riggsdale. I know, like, remember is an actual name, so I'll okay. go with remember, whatever her last oh, name is. Oh my God. I got it wrong again. You did? <laughs> Yo, tell me why this human's name is Resolved White. Resolved White. I resolved some things with you. <laughs> We've cleaned things up. I'm going to move on to the next white. Oh, my God. All right. You have one last chance. Oh, there's more. Okay. <laughs> one last chance. We have Oceanus Doty, Sam Samson, Humility Wilder, and Godbert Godbertson. What? <laughs> <laughs> I really wish it was the last one, but I'm going to go with humility. Yo, it was the last one. Oh, my God. It was Godbert Godbertson. There is a there is a human being on this planet who was named Godbert Godbertson. At one point, yes. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, I got none of these right. But I think you're the true winner. I think you're the true winner for not getting any of these right. <laughs> I'm going to take that as a win. You know, I I just am so disconnected from the colonizers. You have I have to take even the W on this pick one. Their names. <laughs> Like, who can be mad at you getting wrong? Resolved white. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, pilgrims. Yeah. Thank you for providing humor for once this season <laughs> instead of tragedy. <laughs> Yo, it's been so much fun talking to you. This was great. I'm so glad we got to talk again. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Next time, maybe under like not so depressing circumstances. Yeah, but the pilgrim you know? game, that really, that was some good self-care right there. <laughs> True. Shout out, shout out to Godbert Godbertson for the self-care we're all indulging in. Amazing. <laughs> Yo, Dr. Adrian Keene, everyone. Professor Dr. Adrian Keene to you, if you're nasty. Resolved White? How is that a name? So Tracy isn't here this episode because last week she was in North Carolina at Wake Forest University with friend of the show, Melissa Harris-Perry. Hey, girl. Hey. Uh, who invited Tracy to be the Ida B. Wells media expert in residence at the Anna Julia Cooper Center that Melissa runs on campus. What? Look at the sound of that name. What? You could not fit that title on a business card. <laughs> Shout out to Tracy, though. Tracy, I can't fit my title on this business card. Clayton, also known as Brokey McPoverty. We'll work on that. <laughs> but as Tracy was down there in Wake Forest, Tracy did a live show. She and Melissa bought some rounds, and I'm so excited to just take a listen to those. This has been really fun so far. Um, if you're not familiar with the show, we like to wrap things up by buying a round for someone or something that we really, really like. Yes. Melissa, I would love to have you buy a round with me. Are you prepared for that? I am prepared to buy a round with you. Okay, who or what are you buying a round for? Well, I noticed this week on Twitter, despite the fact that I ain't on that cesspool of 140 Smart. characters. See that? I no feel more. like that is self care. You say you're anti self care. That is self care like a motherfucker. No, no, yes, no, 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 no. Yes, it is. That was not self care. That's, what that's was a different it? thing. What was it? <laughs> 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 We're having dinner later. I'll explain the okay, Twitter okay. deletion. I tell y'all some That ain't they damn business. Ooh, I won't that's tell the whole tomorrow. point of deleting it, is it ain't none of it they damn business. I'm going to tell y'all tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's fine. You can tell them. <laughs> Um, but I, but but I did notice um, that you posted a um, a young Biden picture. Oh, girl! Yes, girl. You had all kinds of feelings girl. about the forearms. Girl. They look veiny. I like a really veiny forearm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, also, Twitter has been having all the feelings about the Obama Biden bromance. Brodus, as they call it. Because this it. is the man who, of course, went out in Iowa in 2008, like, you know, very first primary was out, just done. Uh-huh. Was going to be a footnote in history at best. Mm. Has said that Senator Obama was clean and articulate. Mm. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. The politics is not so much your thing. He called Obama articulate? 
Oh, in 2008, he said he was clean and articulate. Clean, because it's rare for... That's right. We be a little bit, you know, mussy. Oh, my God. Yes. He oh said he was God. clean and articulate. And so at the time, young Senator Obama reached back into the dustbin of irrelevance. Mm. Brought old crazy-ass Uncle Joe who just says shit. <laughs> <laughs> like all of our uncles tend to do. Exactly. It was, it was this perfect, like, it's how you understood what kind of presidency the Obama presidency was going to be. Was mm. that what he did in his VP pick was saying, all right, whites, I know. <laughs> Y'all say just all kinds of shit. Mm -hmm. But it's all right. Because mm. I know that when he said clean and articulate, what he meant was, damn, I'm with you. Mm. He reached back and he was like, all right, you come on with me. You're tall. You ride the Amtrak. You, you understand suffering. <laughs> right? You ride Amtrak. <laughs> you ride Amtrak. You understand suffering. You know, you've lost some shit in your life. Right, right. And, and, and you ain't going to try to one up me. You are going to be down with me. Mm -hmm. And Joe Biden loves Barack Obama. He's so cute. In that VP debate, that very first one. Oh my gosh. I rewatched that like I watch old episodes of Law and Order. Yes. It is so fucking good. It's that so good. That shit was real. They asked, they said, what if your, um, the person who is the president dies? Joe Biden looked at them, I was like, what, what, what do you mean he would be dead? <laughs> shut the, I will shut your face. You. <laughs> you jump in front of and nothing will not be dead. <laughs> shut your mouth. <laughs> shut up. He sunned Paul Ryan, the second, he's like, <laughs> he laughed at Paul Ryan that entire debate. The entire, like, I can't believe you are standing here. Mm -hmm. So I would like to buy a round mm -hmm. for vice president. Uncle Joe. Joe, crazy ass, Trans Am, <laughs> motherfucking Biden. Does he drop this crazy? <laughs> I'm with it. I'm with that. Cheers to Joe. Joe. Cheers to Joe Biden. Joe I, Biden. I would date Joe Biden right now. <laughs> My round is for a love of my life who I completely forgot about until a couple of days ago. Mm. I love me some Harry Connick Jr. Oh, yeah. He... He saved the people after the Katrina. Listen! After the Katrina happened! Yeah. Oh, my God! He came oh, for my us. God! Oh, my God! Yeah, he, he totally did came all for of us. The, yeah. um, all of the little In a uh, boat. telethons and shit. You're like, him boat. personally, he was like... Mm. Yeah. He's like, I yeah. need to be saved. Come got y'all. I got y'all. That is some good quality man right there. <laughs> Harry Connick Jr. Harry Connick Jr. got them lips. Harry Connick Jr. was on my favorite show, Law & Order. <laughs> he was the love interest of Olivia Benson. I mean, come on. All, come all on. true. Also, Harry Connick Jr. has rhythm. He's a white man. That's not that common. <laughs> I want y'all, when you have a chance, go to your YouTubes and Google this video. Harry Connick Jr. was once performing someplace with some white people. He's on the piano. He's singing. It's like an old time, good time ass song. I don't know. But the audience was clapping off beat because it was all it's full yeah, of white people. They're, they're on the you know, they yeah. saw they're on the one and three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So what Harry Connick Jr. did, okay, he recognized that shit. And he like flipped or he switched. It. He fixed it. In the middle, he didn't pause. He didn't say y'all clapping wrong. He like added another beat. Bam. On the one, two, three, four. One, two, three. It was amazing. I said, Harry Connick Jr., come and get it. Come and get all of it, half of it, whatever you need. Because if, if he can fix the beat in the middle of it. Harry Connick Jr. can come and get it. Listen, I'm, all right. As much or as little as he needs. I'm just saying. Harry Connick Jr., where you at? All right. Where's the camera? But that wasn't who the round was for. Yes, it is. Oh, it was? Yeah. That was who it was for? It was who my first round was for. Oh, okay. I have another round. My second round. I don't know round. if the two black women can buy rounds just for the whites. We should I think do something else. We should, yeah, all yeah. right. Come on, boil a little more. All right, yeah. yeah, all right. Come on now. If we have to buy 75 rounds tonight. Yes. 
Um, and so actually, I think I will also buy a round for both the Solange and the B mm -hmm. um, for this year. Um, because both with uh, lemonade and with uh, a seat at the table, mm -hmm. I feel like um, those sisters um, gave voice to, in, in very different ways, um, gave voice to ways that black women needed to be at the center of the conversations yes, that we were absolutely. having over the course of this year. Mm -hmm. Just in that title alone, a seat at the table, mm -hmm. um, says something so important about democracy, mm -hmm. that that is where we're supposed to be, not absolutely. just us. But everybody is supposed to have a seat at the table of democracy. And I mean literally everybody. Mm -hmm. Folks who cast their vote for Trump. Folks who cast their vote for Hillary Clinton. Folks who didn't really feel like casting their vote for either one of them. Oof. Everybody in the context of a democracy deserves a seat at the table. And sometimes kind of our art, our music, our laughter is the only place where we can go get that seat. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna buy a round for the for the Knowles sisters today. For the Knowles sisters. Yeah. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. And since you got two rounds, I want two rounds. All right. I mean it couldn't just be Joe Biden and Harry Connick Jr. That's You're right. crazy town. That's Come on not now. what we're here to do. Um, I would also like to buy a round for the Anna Julia Cooper Center. And for everyone connected to it, for the entities that are funding it, any and everything that has anything to do with its existence, I did not know what to expect when I came here pretending to be an expert on anything. I was like, <laughs> what am I going to tell these children? I have no idea. But this week has been so full of great conversations and wonderful questions, I had to think a lot. So when I do interviews, I go for the moment where my interviewee says, oh, that's a great question, or oh, I've never thought about that before, or oh, nobody's ever asked me that. That happened every single day that I was on this campus. And it felt amazing to be challenged again, you know, because I mean, when you're like the only one in your, in like whatever area that you spend the most time in, typically you're the one who's asking the hard questions and you're the one who is teaching other people. But I have learned so much the biggest thing that I have learned from all the kids that I've met, from everyone at the center, from you especially, who I don't know how you're sitting upright right now with all of the shit that you run <laughs> and you do. You've been in like seven states in the last three days. <laughs> I don't understand it. And all of it has been in the interest of giving back. And I have to admit, as a, I don't identify as being a millennial. I'm technically one. Because, like, what, 35 is the cutoff? I don't know. I mean, I'm just old. Cool. Okay. Um, but, I mean, it's, that's honestly not a thing that I've given a lot of thought and credence to, is, like, volunteering my time and my service. You know, I think that when we, we, it's really easy to get comfortable in sitting back and saying profound things online on Twitter because there are people who are saying, oh, you're so important for saying this. Mm. Thank you for having this conversation. And it's important but being here has made me feel like, bitch, do something else. You know what I mean? Like, how can I fuss at people for putting on safety pins and not doing anything else when I'm not out here volunteering my time and my body and my, my that sounded inappropriate. <laughs> Y'all know what I mean. Would you like and to my, volunteer uh, your body? I mean, if Joe Biden's around and he needs some, <laughs> or Harry Connick, I can, listen, community service is a thing I'm interested in. Um, we need to do something and give something to somebody. And this has been a priceless, priceless lesson. I'm so thankful and so grateful that you exist. I'm so glad that you even know who I am and that you invited me here. And I'm excited for tomorrow, which I feel like is a rare resource right now to be <laughs> excited about tomorrow. <laughs> but I really, really, really am. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This round and the rest of my rounds tonight, I feel like there will be many are all for you. Thank y'all. I love y'all so much. <laughs> Thank y'all. Tracy Clayton is live. <laughs> hey y'all. So Thanksgiving is here and that means family food, lasagna, and some contentious conversations that no one wants to have. Uh, family's fun, but when it comes to awkward family time in America, know that you are not alone. So if you're planning on, you know, getting into it with your family, 
because 2016 is already trash and you have nothing to lose and you got to fight for everyone's rights and etc. You know, call us or email us after you do and tell us what happened. Our producers after Thanksgiving are just going to go through all these listener emails and voicemails. And in our upcoming call in show, we're going to just call you all from the studio and chat about what happened. Tell us all the things, all the details, who said what to who, who brought what potato salad and then had the nerve to say, etc., etc. Here's how it's going to work. If you want to call in and talk to us, leave a message at the number 562-448-2899. That's 562-HIT-BUZZ. What? We got it like that. What? Uh, so tell us in 30 seconds or less what your Thanksgiving conversations with your family were like. 30 seconds or less, fam. <laughs> you can also email us at another round at buzzfeed.com and don't forget to say where you're calling from and how to best reach you. We really do want to hear all your family drama. Tell us, girl. Tell us, yo. Shout out to Dr. Adrian Keene for always holding us down and for being the coolest professor you've ever heard of. What? If you're at Brown and you're like not taking a class with her, what are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, shout out to the Paw Squad. Bah, bah, bah. Look at that. Solid. Chiquita's giving me hands. She's like, yeah, you got that. You got that. That was a solid. Bah, bah, bah. Uh, <laughs> this episode was produced by Nina Patak, Julia Furlan, and Chiquita Pascal, with editorial oversight from Eleanor Kagan and Meg Kramer and production support from Cassie Wagler and Meredith Turk. Shout out to Paul Ruest, Argo Studios. Bah, bah, bah. Paul's doing a little air horn, a little mini air horn. I see you, Paul. Uh, shout out to Jean Gray and Donwell for our music, of course. Follow me at Heaven Rants because you know that's what I'll be doing. Uh, yo, shout out to Tracy, who is not even here, but I feel her spirit in the street, okay? Yo, shout out to Brokey McPoverty, which we are still actively hoping to change that Twitter name and change her life. <laughs> if you want to be the sponsor of Brokey McPoverty, please hit her up. Be the uh, Medici family to her art, okay? Okay? Uh, you can email us, tweet us, Facebook us at another round. That's another round at BuzzFeed.com, Twitter.com slash another round, and Facebook.com slash another round. We out here. Rate us on iTunes, tell a friend, nominate us for a Nobel Peace Prize. We'll probably show up. I'm like, Bob Dylan, but I'm not saying nothing. Okay, he can just not show up and still get the award. That's cool. It's not like he like made peace happen. You know? He's just fucking songwriter. Okay, cool. Subscribe to our newsletter at BuzzFeed.com slash another round slash newsletter. And of course, you can find our merch at shop.buzzfeed.com. Y'all, our swag is swagalicious. They should never let me just have a mic by myself. Why is this happening? Friends, loved ones, drink some water, take your meds, call your person. In these times, it has never been more important to follow those three simple steps, y'all. I'd be forgetting my own advice, and I'm like shaking my head i have a sticker that says this how dare i how dare i forget truly i want y'all to take care of yourselves this is a season for healing and a season for being grateful for what we have and i really really am grateful for all of y'all